and welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Rich Alex. Thank you, Rich. Today we're going to be talking about a man named Thomas Midgley Jr. And one of the bad ideas that he was responsible for, Tony. Are you saying that the research went too deep and you couldn't get all the bad ideas? It went so deep. It went so deep on this first bad idea that I just had to throw up my hands and say, I guess you guys can Google the rest of them. The first thing that you need to know about Thomas Midgley Jr. was that he was not a trained chemist. It is very important to have that in mind during this story. So he's like one of those guys that had a gilpin set when he was a kid and made fusion and so on, but didn't have any sort of degree to back it up later. He would have been before the Gilbert nuclear sets. He was born in 1889 and his father, Yeah, that's a little before and his mother's father were both inventors and Midgley naturally enough followed suit. He graduated from Cornell university with a degree in mechanical engineering. It's still a pretty fancy degree. Yeah, not bad, but not chemistry. And this is the first story that was told in a biography of him that was written in the 1950s, before his reputation had been horribly tarnished. And they told the story of how, during his development of his most famous bad idea, he has a lab accident. A test tube or some glass piece of equipment breaks and shards of glass go into his eye. Midgley goes to the doctor and says, Doc, got glass in my eye. What can you do? And the doctor says, I don't know, man. Uh, It looks real delicate. Can't really help you. Midgley says, never mind. I've got this. And his solution to the problem of having glass in his eye was to wash his eye out with mercury. Mercury is not a solution. That's a full-on element. Did I say it was a solution? Oh, I oh, okay. The solution to the I get it. I was a chemistry. I'm joke. lame. I should have rolled with it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a good joke. I was just throwing it out there. But yes, he's. You told me about this a little bit while we were in San Antonio, and it was just like, what? You're gonna throw that toxic chemical into your eyeball and just let it like quicksilver around. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, apparently this did the trick, but I thought that that small incident could maybe provide a window into his attitude towards known toxic substances and their relationship to human beings. Cause that's going to play out on a big scale in this story. Midgley was hired by GM in 1916, and one of the first things they had him working on was solving a problem with the new internal combustion engines they were developing for use in automobiles. In the early days of automobiles, engines would run on nearly anything that could burn, whether it be kerosene or gasoline or alcohol. And when I say alcohol, I mean like any alcohol. Grain alcohol, plant alcohol, if you could distill it in your backyard, it would run in your Ford Model T. And that was actually one of the draws of the Model T. Farmers could literally grow their own fuel and put it in their car and it would run just fine. But as manufacturers sought to make engines more efficient and more powerful, they ran into some problems. And there's a particular problem with one of the engines that Midgley's boss had helped develop. This man whose name was Thomas Kettering was the inventor of the starter motor and the cars that used this new starter motor that he had put in had this really bad knocking program. The engines would make this just ungodly noise to the point where drivers were just freaked out by driving their cars. It was ultimately harmful to the engine itself. And Kettering is facing criticisms of people saying, uh, you put this new starter thing in and it went crazy. It, clearly the starter is the problem. Kettering knows this isn't the problem, but he needs to come up with a solution so that he can prove it. And he puts Midgley on the case. Midgley spent months in the lab trying to find the solution to the problem mostly through a process of trial and error. And this is important 
in this story again to emphasize this man was not a chemist. His approach to solving this problem was just to sit down with a model engine and some gasoline and start mixing stuff with gasoline to see if any of it improved the problem. At one point, he even experimented with adding melted butter to gasoline. He tried adding red dye to the fuel because he erroneously believed that the color red could absorb heat better than other colors. But since there was no red dye in the lab that day, he added iodine instead, and iodine just happened to work. Not because of Midgley's idiotic theory about color, just... It just happened to be good. They tried red dye later and it was nothing. I I was just thinking about how like the red dye was working as uh, an antibacterial for uh, like for infections and things like that. And they thought it was partially because of the dye doing something to the cell, but it was actually not even the dye component that was causing it to actually work as an antiseptic. So I, I would just wonder, I, I thought he was going to be going down like that route where it's like, oh, it's useful for this. Maybe it'll do this. But no, it's just... It's a pretty color that absorbs heat. It looks warm. He literally thought, like, because there are these red flowers that survive in the winter, red must be a color that absorbs heat better. It was a weird, tortured thought process that, again, emphasizes the idea that he was not a chemist. Uh, So he does find this iodine solution that works. The problem is iodine is relatively expensive. You don't want to have to add enough of that to your gasoline to stop the knocking because then your prices of gas are going to go up. But there was another solution that presented itself to the problem, and that was mixing ethanol with gasoline. We mentioned earlier alcohol from plants was already something that you could put into your car Ethanol would not burn as efficiently as gasoline, but mixing some ethanol in with the gasoline got rid of the knocking problem. And because you've already got a bunch of it around because cars are already running on ethanol, it's easy to produce, but it wasn't quite as efficient. Yeah, and we still use a lot of ethanol today in like gasoline mixtures. Yes, uh, which was something that we could have been doing literally the whole time. We could have just been using ethanol the whole time. The only problem with ethanol was that at this time, you needed one and a third gallon of ethanol to take you as far as a gallon of gasoline would. And that was a concern for airplanes, which was what Midgley was originally working on in World War I. During the Great War, he's assigned to working on airplane engines, and obviously there you want the most efficient fuel possible. But in a car, it's not so crucial that you get every ounce out of every gallon. It was commonly accepted doctrine in the 1920s that the world would soon run out of oil and eventually everyone would be using ethanol from plants. That's an idea that's not quite ever died. And in the mid 2000s, the idea of peak oil was very big again. It's interesting to think about the fact that way back here in the very early stages of automotive and oil mining and all of that they were like guys we're gonna run out of this oil like any day now so let's keep that ethanol option open and i definitely remember hearing all the like so many people actually saying that and it seems like that's we always end up finding like another reserve somewhere i know that that can't work forever but it is interesting that they were thinking this a hundred years ago And the problem was for them at the time that ethanol production was not quite up to the same speed the oil production was. So for the time being, they were thinking, okay, we're going to run on oil. Eventually, we'll get better at producing ethanol. We'll do more of that. We'll transition away from oil. We just need enough of a solution to keep oil working until that can catch up. And we got to stop this knocking. Now, remember, we already have one solution, that's adding ethanol, but Midgley keeps experimenting anyway. And in 1921, Midgley discovered a compound called tetraethyl lead could help stop the knocking problem. There was just, like, the one tiny problem, which is that tetraethyl lead is made out of lead. Yeah, and (laughs) you're basically just going to be spewing lead out of the exhaust yes and it's worth remembering 
there have been times in the history of progress when new exciting substances are discovered and put into use and then later on we find out oh man that was actually dangerous and we didn't understand that at the time that's not the case with tetraethyl lead lead and compounds of lead had been understood to be poisonous to humans for over 2000 years The Romans wrote about how it was better not to use lead pipes because lead pipes led to houses that had dumb people in them. And maybe there was a connection there. Just maybe. It's like if you're if you're figuring these things out pre-scientific method, it's got to be pretty apparent what's happening. Midgley himself was forced to take an entire year of leave after experimenting with tetraethyl lead because his lungs had been so damaged by the fumes. So, why did GM push forward with the production of leaded gasoline? Everyone's favorite answer, Tony, is evil oil companies. <laughs> and in this case, there is a lot of truth to that. GM was building cars, and cars ran on oil, which meant that GM was tight with standard oil company. If they'd gone with a 20% ethanol additive, the percentage of oil sold would have been much lower than one part per thousand of tetraethyl lead required. You just put a couple of drops of tetraethyl lead in a gallon of gasoline and you're good, but 20%, maybe 15 you can get by with on ethanol was what was required, which means you'd be selling less oil. GM had their own profit motive driving the decision too. Because it wasn't possible to patent ethanol Anyone could make their own gasoline ethanol mixture and GM would be forced to compete on price alone. But since GM owned the patent on adding tetraethyl lead to gasoline, they could make money, not only selling gas directly, but also through royalties from anyone who wanted to sell leaded gasoline. Finally, prohibition might have played a factor in pushing the United States away from ethanol. Despite the fact that ethanol fuel was not specifically banned by prohibition, the fact that the factories making liquor could simply repackage their product as fuel didn't sit well with the politicians that had pushed through the alcohol ban. If ethanol was promoted as a major fuel source, the devils who made their fortune selling booze to the masses would escape relatively unscathed. So, GM decided to move ahead with tetraethyl lead. I do like the idea that just because it would be so much easier to, like, make alcohol and kind of, like, siphon it off and sell it, that actually ended up being a factor. I would have been pushing for that just so it'd be like, well, there's more there's more black market alcohol out there. Yeah, well, that was probably what they were worried about. I think there is a, a popular little factoid that goes around Reddit every once in a while that at one point ethanol fuel actually had poison added to it so that people wouldn't pump it into bottles and drink it because really there's nothing in ethanol besides alcohol and you could just drink it if you wanted to. Yeah, it's like the whole thing where you can make uh, you can make ethanol at your house right now if you have the right permit, but you're not allowed to make your own spirits without like a, a DEA level permit. So if you wanted to make moonshine, all you have to do is call it ethanol and then it's legal so long as you pretend like you're not drinking it. While we're in the fun fact area, I would also like to mention something I learned that I did not realize. The color of gasoline is not natural. They add red dye to nat- to gasoline to make it that red color. I was totally... Your gasoline ad- is red? Yeah, you don't ever see that little little bit of a reddish I've tint? never I've, I've never noticed it. It's always just looked clear to me. It's not perfectly clear. Maybe yellowish? They add dye to it. Today on If Tony Remembers Random Things About Pumping Gas. So, GM moves forward with leaded gasoline, which, as we have already mentioned, contained lead, a widely understood poisonous substance. And almost immediately after GM and their partners at DuPont began production of the first tetraethyl lead gasoline run, concerns were raised about its safety. A lab director for the U.S. Public Health Service named William Mansfield Clark wrote to the Assistant Surgeon General expressing concerns about the danger tetraethyl lead posed, noting problems with lead poisoning and the production of the chemical as well as the dangers it could pose once released into the atmosphere. But his concerns were ignored because the Public Health Service didn't want to invest the time and money necessary to investigate the dangers themselves. 
Instead, they proposed using research that they assumed had already been done by the industry that stood to profit from selling mm. leaded gasoline. And despite being unwilling to actually take any action to investigate the dangers, Surgeon General H.S. Cumming wrote a letter to DuPont stating his concerns with the process. Quote, Inasmuch as it is understood that when employed in gasoline engines, this substance will add a finely divided and non-diffusible form of lead to exhaust gases, and furthermore, since lead poisoning in human beings is of the cumulative type, resulting frequently from the daily intake of minute quantities, it seems pertinent to inquire whether there might not be a decided health hazard associated with the extensive use of lead tetraethyl engines, end quote. Midgley himself responded to this letter from Florida, where he was convalescing from the effects of lead poisoning from interacting with tetraethyl lead. <laughs> First, he told the Surgeon General that GM had not actually done any studies at all to prove the safety of tetraethyl lead. But he went on to say that it was his opinion as a mechanical engineer who had once added butter to gasoline that, quote, the average street will probably be so free from lead that it will be impossible to detect it or its absorption. I just don't get how he says all this whenever he's literally like dying of lead poisoning or almost dying. Meanwhile, GM continued to charge forward with leaded gasoline. They had production well underway now and were ready to start advertising the leaded gasoline as the fuel of the future, the must-have for the high-powered cars GM was marketing to the upscale customer who required a higher class of transportation than the affordable fuddy-duddy Ford. Yeah, and they were probably like a total of like 30 horsepower. It was amazing. I mean, considering you're going up from 15 or 20 for the Model T, it's a, it's a step up. But that is true. It's interesting to think about this particular move that gets made here because before now, people had thought that the future of engines was making them more efficient. And GM says, no, no, the future is making them more powerful. And their advertisements focused on, oh man, your car got passed by the other guy who is better than you because he has money. <laughs> Buy our car. Now, they carefully avoided saying that there was lead in their gasoline for no particular reason. Let's just, it's not toxic. So why would you even want to mention why it? Why would like, we bring it up worth, at all? It's not worth thinking about. Instead, they use the moniker ethyl, a word that sounded close enough to ethanol that the average customer wouldn't ask too many questions. But as production ramped up, workers in the factory started dying, spending their last days raving in straight jackets in an insane asylum. Others became very ill, and hallucinations of insects were so common among factory workers that they began to refer to the tetraethyl plant as the House of Butterflies. That's such a strange, like, shared hallucination. It's got to be something about, uh, like, just the simple shape of the things they thought they saw that would be bug-like. Or how it affected the brain. We're still yeah. not 100% sure exactly what lead does. It's a multifactorial attack on the system. Now, GM was able to keep these deaths from the public, but they realized that they were in danger of being accused of malfeasance. So they went to the Bureau of Mines to ask them to investigate the dangers of tetraethyl lead. Now, this was probably not a wholly sincere attempt to learn if there was danger, but instead, an insurance policy GM could hold up in defense if they were prosecuted. And it's worth knowing that despite being a government agency nominally, the Bureau of Mines saw themselves as promoters of business rather than regulators. And they were eager to help GM keep its very profitable poison on the market. When one worker at the Bureau of Mines questioned why they were using the term ethyl in their internal communications rather than lead, his boss replied, quote, if it should happen to get some publicity accidentally, it would not be so bad if the word lead were omitted, as this term is apt to prejudice somewhat against its use. This reminds me so much of whenever we were talking about the asbestos people and how they started changing what they called it in internal memos. <laughs> I forgot like, about that. Yeah, but it's, this it's isn't even GM. lines. It's not GM doing it. It's the people in the government saying, well, if somebody leaks some of this stuff, it's better if we're using the company term. 
That sounds like somebody who's got some shares of GE or whatever. GM. GM, sorry. <laughs> General, General Electric does not make cars. <laughs> I'm sure they've done something bad somewhere to me. Well, I'm, I'm sure the GE probably makes like wiring harnesses or something like that for cars, but not what we're talking about. They should probably pay taxes someday, but that's a different bad idea. GM would later amend their agreement with the Bureau of Mines to the effect that, quote, before publication of any papers or articles by your bureau, they should be submitted to them, that is GM, for comment, criticism, and approval, end quote. So whatever you guys find out, just let us know first. Just give us the rough draft so we can make sure to edit out any, you know, problems this sounds a lot like what's happening with like uh, modern media and like the military where you have to get like certain stories approved first. It's like word for word. We're going to make sure that it's okay for you to say these things. I'm less annoyed with that. Although I think that there are some potential problems, but I don't want anybody getting killed because somebody wants to get a scoop. So yeah, I, I'm more saying about like the, uh, the potential for censoring information that should be out there versus like, and it's hard to know where like that, exactly style. you get to draw that line. Yeah. More people were poisoned and some died. These are workers in the factories. Midgley himself started having second thoughts about the wisdom of continuing with the project, but his boss, a man named Charles Kettering, who we already mentioned, was all in for tetraethyl lead. Kettering was recovering from the crushing failure of a pet project of his at GM, and he was determined to prove that his lab was still capable of turning a profit for the company. He had gone all in for this air-cooled engine idea that just didn't end up working out and cost the company a lot of money, and he sees that if he doesn't come up with something that turns around his stock in the company pretty quickly, he's maybe going to get the boot. And this is despite the fact that Kettering was personally disturbed by the push for more powerful engines over more efficient ones. He puts aside his own principles in order to improve his standing with the company. GM's president, Alfred Sloan, was personally worried about the obvious dangers of the product, but when he wrote of these concerns to DuPont head Irene DuPont, DuPont responded by pointing out that it was far more dangerous to manufacture nitroglycerin than tetraethyl lead, and that the erosion of lead paint would infect the environment more than leaded gas fumes ever could. So his argument back is essentially, listen, bad stuff going to happen. We're already doing real dangerous stuff with nitroglycerin. Leaded paint already on everybody's walls. Kids eating it like candy. How bad could this really be? But it tastes so good. (laughs) Apparently it did. (laughs) Kids were compelled. DuPont went ahead with the manufacture of tetraethyl lead, but GM was worried they weren't producing fast enough to corner the market. If tetraethyl lead had to compete with other safer anti-knock agents, all their research would be for naught. So GM partnered with Standard Oil to produce tetraethyl gasoline at even higher capacities. Standard was even less concerned with safety than DuPont, and within two months of operation, five of their workers were dead, and nearly everyone at the plant was too sick to be able to continue working. That is insane. Like, And this is just at the manufacturing plant for the gasoline? Like, yes. Like, where they're putting in the... Te- the okay. Yeah, it's so just, Standard Oil has a lot more experience it? with the large-scale production of gasoline. They have a lot more experience with refining, so they know how to do this stuff at scale, but they don't care at all about safety. And they're just sort of... They have people on their factory floor with shovels shoveling out lead residue from the chamber that was used to make tetraethyl lead. The two, the DuPont engineers show up at the standard oil plant and they're just like horrified at how unsafe it is. And don't forget DuPont killed some people with their plant and got their place named house of butterflies. And these guys are like, you guys aren't nearly safe enough. House of butterflies sounds so nice compared to what was actually. It's a cool horror movie name. I think we need to, we need to develop a horror movie script that involves early industrial horror and also like actual scary things that are like butterflies. Yeah, and have the guy that did House of Leaves do it. Maybe. The problems became so big that even Standard Oil couldn't keep them under wraps. 
But when asked about the deaths and the rampant sickness, the chief chemist at the lab waved it away saying, quote, these men probably went insane because they worked too hard. It's, it's easy to work too hard when you're being exposed to lead, apparently. And this would not be the only example of victim blaming in the story of leaded gasoline. Thomas Midgley himself said that the problems with the production of tetraethyl stemmed from the workers playing around with the liquid in the factory. And Standard would go on to deride their poisoned workers for not understanding that the production of tetraethyl lead was a, quote, man's undertaking, end quote. This sounds a lot like what they were saying for the radium girls who are like painting themselves in radium because they didn't know the awfulness of How what radiation did. How did you not know did. it was super, super dangerous? Yeah. We, we told you to do it all the time and to test it out on your hands and stuff like that, but... To yeah. be fair, there were requirements of, like, you got these suits that you're supposed to wear. So that was their argument. Like, look, you guys had to suit up every day and we told you not to take any of this home. You should have known it was dangerous. <laughs> so maybe they weren't quite as awful as the Radium Girls guys, but they're still, they're, they're, they're still on the scale of real bad awful. Midgley himself was called up from his vacation in Florida, which, in case you've forgotten, he took because he got lead poisoning from tetraethyl lead to do damage control. He rose to the challenge by standing in front of reporters and washing his hands in a bowl of tetraethyl lead, claiming he was taking no risk whatsoever. Newspapers would later stretch this story into a claim that Midgley regularly bathed in tetraethyl lead. Yeah, he probably also gave himself enemas with it just to make the story better. <laughs> like a little sip. It's fine. It's no big deal. <laughs> but New Jersey, where the standard oil plant was located, wasn't having any of it and quickly banned the production and sale of leaded gasoline in the state. It was also banned in New York City, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. And all of these bans essentially meant that tetraethyl lead and leaded gasoline were effectively gone from the east coast at this point in response to this gm and standard oil released the report from the bureau of mines which they've been holding on to because they had the right to do that under their contract with the bureau of mines and the report of course claimed that leaded gasoline was perfectly safe in addition to this, there was a sense among some scientists and chemists that tetraethyl lead represented the inevitable progress afforded by the onward march of science. The deaths were tragic, yes, but to turn away from leaded gasoline was tantamount to turning away from science itself. Midgley continued his publicity campaign for leaded gasoline by claiming that there were no other known anti-knock agents. Despite him, like, figuring out that it worked with iodine. And ethanol. And ethanol. And, and probably, probably some other stuff, other too. Yes. No, this, this is only, only leaded gasoline. In fact, this is so much of a lie that there are reports that... I'm sorry. This is so much of a lie that we have documentation of Midgley recommending to the military that they not use leaded gasoline because he doesn't have all the kinks worked out yet and ethanol is a better alternative for the engines that they're going to be using. But that, that wasn't public and Midgley's just like, no, this is the only thing, man. It would be great if there was another thing that we could use, but there's not. It's like, did just they actually, this. like have him on like the payroll for these major companies. Like did he get a percentage of all the like extra gas they were able to sell because of this 15 to 20% ethanol? At a certain point, he's literally on the board of the ethyl company that GM and Standard Oil form together. He's like vice president. Okay. He gets kicked oh. off eventually as things start to go a little bit further south because it's a bad look. And also because they're like, hey, we got these scientists on this board. We really want more business people. Because that's the problem. <laughs> Is they're not yeah, there's too many scientists enough. telling us we can't do the things we want to do. And this is also at the same time that his boss, Charles F. Kettering, was on a quest to find another alternative. In addition to the other alternatives we already have that Midgley says don't exist, Kettering says, okay, fine, we have to solve this. People are getting poisoned. I don't want to be the one who is responsible for putting poison in the environment. Maybe there's another solution. He goes to Europe 
under the guise of doing some other thing for GM, but actually he wants to research some other alternatives to leaded gasoline. And he finds something called iron carbonyl, which is being experimented with in Europe. And European scientists say, hey, this is great. This will work just as well as lead. Kettering, though, isn't satisfied with how this substance interacted with the engine. He said it left some residue on the spark plug. He didn't like what it did to the oil. There, it, it did not perform up to his level of expectations. And so he comes home essentially empty-handed. He does patent the process of adding this iron stuff to gasoline, but it never takes off and tetraethyl lead continues to be produced. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here that makes this story even more tragic because as tetraethyl lead comes on the market and other gasoline manufacturers realize that octane is the name of the game, that people want more powerful gas, they start experimenting with the refining process. And they managed to produce gasoline that has anti-knock properties and is a higher octane than the leaded gasoline was purely by changing the way it was refined. And so GM sees that there is this writing on the wall that there is going to be this alternative to leaded gasoline regardless. And what they do, instead of giving in or instead of trying to compete, they just say, you know what, y'all can all, for a very nominal fee have the license to sell your own tetraethyl gasoline leaded gasoline it's out there for everybody why don't you guys just all take a little chunk of this pie again the smallest most nominal fee we're we're just gonna charge our little royalty and that's it and you can have the benefits of lead in your gasoline don't worry about trying to fix the problem without adding lead let let's just all be on the wagon for leaded gas I mean, just get them to join. Just get that contract. Get them to do it. And it worked. The process for producing leaded gasoline was eventually made quite a bit safer. But the trade-off was that particulate lead was now being belched out into the air by millions of motor vehicles each day. Research into the safety of lead fumes was done, but despite worrying findings, the technology to measure microdoses of lead poisoning had not been developed at that time to the point where definitive claims about its danger could be justified. So there are people who are worried about lead poisoning from the very beginning, but they just don't have instruments that can be calibrated finely enough to say for sure, oh, even a very, very small amount is going to be a bad time for you, so let's not do it. But as the years went on, worries about the dangers of leaded gas never entirely vanished, and as more precise measurements were developed, it became clear that lead pollution was a big problem. Even tiny amounts of lead were found to lower the average IQ by several points, and some studies have linked more lead in the environment to higher crime rates. The U.S. slowly took action to remove lead from gasoline and other products throughout the 1970s, but leaded gasoline is still sold in many third world countries. It's just so bizarre that they actually still sell it. Every time we do one of these stories, they're still somewhere using these awful, toxic, horrible things. Yeah, and the funny thing is GM eventually spins off Ethel, right? They're, like, Ethel becomes its own company. And then in the 70s, GM starts campaigning, you guys got to get the lead out of your gasoline. And the ethyl people are like, Daddy, why? You hate me and now you hate me. Because GM saw the writing on the wall and they're like, we're going to not be those people anymore. But they were. They always were. The story of leaded gasoline is a clear example of the dark side of profit motive. Nearly every action taken by the purveyors of leaded gasoline was aimed at the goal of avoiding competition with other alternative fuels. No price was too high to pay to accomplish that goal. Truth, principle, and even life itself were sacrificed on the altar of profit. And many of these people just got away with it, Tony. But there's like a sliver of a happy ending. Because Thomas Midgley Jr., This isn't his last bad idea. It's not even his second to last bad idea. His next bad idea is Freon, which 
Freon's pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. A, it was better than what they were using before, and B, he had no way of knowing about the ozone hole. It seemed fine at the time. So let's... I mean, he's, he did two of the worst environmental things you could possibly do, but, like, <laughs> at least it wasn't him actively lying during the Freon one. I guess that makes it better. Yeah, that would happen later if he would have, you know, been around. The final bad idea that Midgley has, though, is another one of his inventions. He becomes very sick, and he has difficulty getting himself in and out of bed. He has mild paralysis of some kind, and rather than having to have people help him in and out of bed, he invents a pulley system that he can get himself into to lift him out of his bed. And Thomas Midgley Jr., one fine morning, was found strangled by his own invention, the pulley system, that he intended to lift him up out of his bed. Well, at least something he invented finally took him out. Yes, after taking out arguably, like, the whole of human society, it's so tough to know, because the, the argument that DuPont made about leaded paint is a real thing that probably was a greater contributor to individual human lead poisoning but both of those things were really 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 bad and it's there's no way to know even if it's a few percentage points of iq if you take that off of the entire population of a country for 50 years which is how long lead was in operation as a major fuel source what does that do? How much further could we be along if this hadn't happened? And how much are we still paying the price? It's it's difficult to know, and I'm not making any definitive statements, but it seems like it was not worth it. Definitely not. Not because of engine knocking noises. Especially considering that there were safer alternatives that everybody knew about. Yeah, but you read the memo. There's no safer alternatives. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Bad Ideas. If you enjoyed it, I hope that you'll tell a friend about us or click on that like button over on our YouTube page. If you have bad ideas you want us to cover, you should send them into badideasshow at gmail.com. And if you want to help support us, you can go to patreon.com slash human echoes and become a patron where you get these episodes a whole week earlier than everybody else. And you get to help make the wheels turn here without leaded gasoline. Yep. We promise we will not be using any leaded gasoline to push this out to the world. Bye, guys. Bye.